Well, they say whenever the cat's away that the mice will play. So I appreciate you guys being here. I know that um, Pastor Ed's more like a lion than he is uh, a cat. <laughs> but he's a lion for the Lord, and so I have great admiration for him. And I appreciate the, the welcoming and the... Um, just um, being brought into the family. I grew up in a church very similar to Tessina Kamako, and uh, my dad, was he's been a pastor all my life, still is, and um, so I feel very comfortable and feel at home here as well, and uh, glad to be back, thankful for the opportunity, and I want to give you a chance to turn to Jonah chapter 1, and we're just going to read a couple verses here, although our, our goal will actually be to cover the whole book. Um, the whole book of Jonah today will be our goal. Uh, Jonah is found in the minor prophets in the Old Testament, and it's sandwiched between Obadiah and the book of Micah. So it's kind of hard to find. It's only four chapters. But I think that we can accomplish our goal today. Whenever I was in seminary working on my master's, I took three semesters of Hebrew. So, believe it or not, at one point in my life, I could actually read uh, the book of Jonah in its original language. Um, the third semester that you take with, uh, with Hebrew is that you go really, really deep. And part of the time that we spent was learning uh, the book of Ruth, and we learned the book of Jonah. So, what I'm going to try to do is give you guys about a half semester's worth of seminary class today. <laughs> um, because Jonah is so rich and it's so meaningful and it's so there's so much power behind it and it does a, such a wonderful and great job of demonstrating the character of God. But if I was to ask you what you think about when it comes to the book of Jonah, a lot of people would keep it to a very small portion of what the book is about. So it'll be my hope and my goal that the Lord would bring the scripture of life today. And by way of reading... If you're able to, I would like for you to stand as we read in reverence of God's Word. We're just going to read the first three verses in order to uh, use that as an anchor uh, for the book as we start off here. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh that great city, and call out against it. For their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found the ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. So let's pray. Holy God, we just humbly come before you today. We bow our hearts before you, and we would humbly ask that you would remove all things from our hearts that need to be removed. God, we pray that you would instill inside of our hearts everything that you wish to be there, and we pray that by your grace that you would bring your word alive to us in the most magnificent and meaningful way today as we worship you in spirit and in truth at Tessina Kamako. God, we love you, and we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So please be seated. So as we study the book of Jonah today, what I would like to do is determine, if we could, just to boil down the book into four major themes. I think that they could be broken up or developed in different ways, but for our purposes today, we have time to look at four major themes in the book of Jonah. And we're going to hop in because the first one here is actually mentioned twice, even in these first three verses, is that there's a theme of running from the presence of the Lord. So here what we find is that Jonah very physically ran or attempted to run from the presence of the Lord. We don't know how the Lord came to Jonah. Perhaps it was in a dream. Maybe he had a vision or there was a collection of um, friends that he had that just kind of had that um, you know, discernment in the heart that God wanted him to do this. We're not sure. But we do know the way that Jonah responded is that if you looked at uh, Nineveh and Tarshish on a map... 
They're in the exact opposite direction of where Jonah was located. If Jonah went down to the port and he went to, um, if he went to Nineveh, let's say, for example, let's just say that he'd be heading east. Well, Tarshish was the west. So he quite literally and purposefully went to this port to board a ship going in the exact opposite direction. So obviously, of course, we can, uh, we can do that today. Uh, people can flee from the presence of the Lord. What comes to my mind is that there can be people that the Lord says, I want you to go to church. Or I want you to start going to church. Or it might be an unbeliever to say, I want you to give your life to me. And those people at various times, uh, perhaps you've in some sort, uh, in, in, before you came to Christ, understand how that person might feel and that they want to get away from the presence of the Lord. Um, so you can quite literally do that from a physical location. But one of the things that I think that really comes to light is that running from God's presence is not always a physical action. It can actually be just in your heart that as you're wrestling with God through something He would have you to do, a place that He would have you to go, a conversation He would have you to have, uh, you can actually go in the opposite direction. You can attempt to flee from the presence of the Lord. I can look back through my life and I can, um, I can see, and how I would word it is that God made His presence very real to me. Um, there was once during a revival service that um, I was sitting about in this location during that service and they were having um, a service for confession or part of the service was to confess. And I was just sitting there wrestling with God because He put in my heart something I was so dramatically convicted by. And I remember during that time that there was, I led um, special uh, music for our church on a Sunday morning and I actually messed up the song and I was so embarrassed uh, I remember just going and sitting down and almost you know weeping and pouting because I felt like I had messed it up but um, during that revival service and this was sometime later the Lord really made me uh, I remember I was charging the Lord as uh, as I sat in the pew after I sang, that I said, God, I was trying to do that for you. Why would you let me fail? Why would you let me embarrass myself in something I was trying to do for you? And so that was my mindset for some time until that revival service when the Lord said, you weren't really doing that for me. You were doing that for you. And I was utterly broken over a very specific instance. And in that, for, in that example, I didn't flee. I actually responded to the Lord and came forward. And I made confession before the church. And I just felt the burden of the Lord lifted off of me. And I'm thankful for that. There was other times in that same church that I just felt God's hand upon me. Uh, whenever He was calling me to remove something from my life or pass on to you know, a, a better way of life. And um, so I think that God makes His presence aware to us at various times and to us individually. While he's speaking to you, he can also speak at the same time to somebody else. So, uh, I would just encourage you that whenever you come to a point of a spiritual conviction in your life, what God is trying to do is not allow you to bury it, but also to bring it forward. So, let us consider to not run from the presence of the Lord. I would also point out that a second theme in the book of Jonah is God's sovereignty over creation. We spoke of one in that God made himself aware to Jonah in some shape, in some form, where he commissioned him and Jonah fled. But, you know, God's in charge. He's able to make himself fully aware or to us at any time that he pleases. But we also see in a matter of ways that Jonah wound up getting onto this ship but it says that God hurled a great wind against the sea. Later in chapter 1, we see that God used a pagan custom or a cultural custom, the throwing of lots. And then he pointed out that it was Jonah uh, who was the cause of this great storm in the first place. Um, God, in chapter 3, demonstrates that he welds the power to destroy an entire city. 
Then in chapter 4, God appoints a plant to grow, to comfort Jonah, then a worm to eat it, and a scorching wind and hot sun to annoy Jonah. Okay, so God's major hand, uh, his mighty hand is all over this book, right? And for us, it's great to reflect on that, that if you're a gardener, you know, or a farmer, it's good to take your, your crops or your, your produce or your animals to the Lord to ask his blessings on it. You know, in any way, whenever there's a storm, whenever there's the threat of flooding, you can bring that to the Lord and be praying upon it. Or if you happen to be in a boat, when a storm comes, I'm sure you're going to get on your knees, just like Jonah and the uh, other sailors did. But perhaps most, most infamously, of God's sovereignty over creation is that God sent a great fish to swallow Jonah. Whenever he confessed to the sailors that he was the reason for the storm, he told them, toss me into the sea. Reluctantly, they finally did it. And as Jonah was plummeting into the depths, it says that God sent a great fish to swallow him. Now, for the purposes of children's messages and, you know, uh, vacation Bible schools, that's the point that usually gets highlighted. It's Jonah and the whale, um, or Jonah and the fish, that most people come to the book of Jonah, and that's what they think about, or that's uh, the point of learning that they've had in the past. But again... Jonah is so rich, and it just continues to unfold that God is not just sovereign over a fish. If you would look at the title, if you had looked at the title of the sermon in, um, in the bulletin, the title of the sermon is not Jonah and the whale. It's actually Jonah and the Ninevites. And the purpose of that title is very intentional. It's to help direct attention to the real meaning of the book of Jonah. And so that actually begins to unfold in more detail in Jonah chapter 3. If we go into Jonah chapter 3, it covers this great event where the theme, or the third theme, is that God loves when sinners repent. God loves even when the most wicked sinners repent. Repent. So there's actually three instances of repentance in this book. The first one would be is that Jonah confessed to the sailors. He said, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord. But he also, uh, they also found out in chapter 1 that he was fleeing the presence of the Lord and had made uh, his God angry. They actually incited him to praise his individual God. But what, what winds up happening is that these pagan sailors who worship their own individual gods actually come to worship the one true God of the universe. Which is very interesting. That even in the midst of this dire situation for Jonah, God used it for good in that he brought lost sinners to himself. I'd also say that uh, it appears... And I want to be very gentle here, and I'll, you'll see why. But it also appears that Jonah had some sort of repentant heart as well. You can imagine that as he's diving or falling into the depths of the sea. And chapter 2 is virtually a prayer that he gives to God. And he says, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. And he goes on to explain that um, he's looking towards God. And verse 7, he says, When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came to you into your holy temple. So in verse 9, um, he says, But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. So both of those, I think, are key, especially in verse 9, is that I think that as a prophet of God, that Jonah had a personal vow that he would do what God wanted him to do, to preach what God wanted him to preach. But in this instance, you can see he's actually not wanting to do that. But he finally submits, I would say, and he says, what I have vowed, I will pay. And then he acknowledges this, salvation belongs to the Lord. Now, God saved Jonah from death. Uh, he saved the sailors from death. But I think that that 
little line right there is very key in that God, Jonah is acknowledging that whomever the Lord would save is okay. That it's perfectly fine or should be perfectly fine with whom the Lord saves. So you, we have to understand that Jonah himself appears to have at least a partial repentance of his attitude. But I would not say it's complete. <laughs> uh, if you've ever been told, you know, as a child to go clean your room uh, and you do it, but you're mad about it. Uh, that's kind of what Jonah's like in this point. It's like he's, he's going to do it. But he's going to be upset about it the whole time. He's going to be kicking things into the closet and, you know, throwing his blankets over his bed. And, you know, maybe scruffing them up and flopping the pillows real hard. You know, he's not happy to be there. Even though it would seem that because he finally submitted that he's finally there. But there's more to Jonah. We do see in chapter 3 that Jonah is going forth. Uh, he goes to three, it, it takes uh, three days journey in breath, uh, the, this great city, this exceedingly great city. And basically what that means is that Jonah probably was going about the three different major places in the city of Nineveh. Okay, we come to find out that there's at least 120,000 people that live in this one city. And to put that in perspective, I live in James City County where there's about 75,000 residents in the whole county. And then, the, you know, in comparison to Nineveh, Nineveh's got 50,000 more people than my entire county. So you can imagine a great group of people in a very small place. But God used it and God anointed him. Uh, with this message, what he was saying, we learned in verse 1, he said, Go preach, for their evil has come up to me. And so, um, as he's going about preaching in Nineveh, the Lord just anointed him. He said, Forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. This is Nineveh, or Jonah chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. And it says, And the people of Nineveh believed God. So here we see that the people begin to repent for the evil that they had in their heart. And the people started, they started fasting, they put on sackcloth, and sackcloth is a outward demonstration of the inwardness of your heart. You know, this movement, this revival, began, it, it was so massive that the king of Nineveh, the entire king of the city, was impacted and he's like, there must be something real. If there's something here where this God is preaching this message and my people are responding in this way, then I too am going to join this because I am broken of my heart. He called actually for a fast. A fast for not just every man, woman, and child, but also even for the, the beast and, and the herd of the flock. No animals were allowed to either drink nor uh, feed. And so... The king of Nineveh, you know, think about what he's doing here. Um, he arose from his throne, and if you think about who a king is or where he sits, like he's removing himself from the, one, one, the, the place that identifies him with his role. He's removing himself from the most lofty place, and he's putting himself in a very humble place. Uh, he puts himself into ashes. He removed his robe. And covered himself with sackcloth. And he sat in these ashes. So you can see that the king was convicted. And he was beginning to acknowledge the one true God of the universe and his mighty hand. And he himself is removing him, himself from the place as a king that he should sit. You know, that's a very humble expression. You know, for this guy, we will learn, was very evil. And he did himself a 180. <laughs> Jonah did a 180, so did the king of Nineveh. So, here we are, this king. He says in verse 8 of chapter 3, Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. Going into verse 10, it says this, how mighty and powerful, how wonderful. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said. How he would do that to them. 
and he decided not to do it. What a great God that we serve. God loves when sinners repent. God loves when even the most wicked people turn from their evil ways, the violence that is in their heart, and come to God. And you would have thought that Jonah would be so excited. You would think that he would be shouting and jumping and be thankful that God saved these 120,000 people. But we, what we actually find, the punchline, if you will, to the book of Jonah in chapter 4. In chapter 4, we learn the major point in the final theme that we can discuss today. The final theme regards stone-hearted believers. What you need to know is that Nineveh was a city in the country of Assyria. And Assyria was itself uh, a greater representation of the city of Nineveh. Assyria, if you're interested in history or if you're interested in archaeology, there is plenty of artifacts today that you can look up and see that are thousands of years old of kings of Assyria that go out on battle rages. And as they go, uh, they do the most horrible things. In these artifacts, we learn uh, what they do. They would say, like, I, as king of Assyria, and mention his name, I, when I went against this army, I did this. And it was very horrible. It was very bad. We have depictions of that. Uh, they would put it on, uh, on stone tablets. They would uh, imprint it in pillars. Um, we have uh, these stories and archives of this even today. But the types of things that they would do are uh, in many ways resemble what the Nazis did to the Jews. There was, uh, kings would brag about uh, decapitating um, their, their enemies, and they would take their heads and pile them up as, as huge as could be. Uh, if they were besieging a city, they would take any captives and string them up and then begin to fillet their flesh so that as the people were screaming, it was a type of torture to the people inside the city as well. They would cut off people's hands or their arms. Um, they would mutilate men. They would take spears and shove it up into people and, and mount them up and, and slowly let that spear go uh, through their body. Um, they would enslave people. They would cut out their tongues, their eyeballs, cut off their ears. And all these horrible things that they just didn't do, but they took pride in doing them. But what we come to find out throughout history is that Israel itself, was in many battles against the Assyrians. You see, uh, we have uh, documents here in our own Bible that depict uh, the, the battles against the Assyrians. But we also have Assyrian records that mention kings of Israel that they went about, and also as they brag about the things that they've done. So what we have here, going back to Jonah, is that the reason that Jonah didn't want to go in the first place was because he was afraid that God was going to forgive them. He was afraid that God was going to give grace. It says that, call out to them the evil that God had, that their, that their evil has come up before me. But when we see that the people of Israel are saved, let us look into chapter 4, verse 1. It says, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was angry, and he prayed to the Lord and said, and this is how I would do it. If, if I wanted to depict Jonah, I would take my finger and point it towards God, and this is what I would say. Oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful. You are slow to anger and you have bowed in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Those are wonderful characteristics of the God that we worship. But those were characteristics that Jonah did not want his enemy to experience. 
Jonah was a hard-hearted believer. And he didn't want God's grace to be given to people that he hated. That's why he didn't want to go to Nineveh. And that's why he fled in the opposite direction. And that's the punchline. Because what happened is that Jonah, the story's about Jonah. But really, it's symbolic of the entire nation of Israel who had lost their way. God had commissioned the Israelites, just like He's commissioned us as Christians, to take His glory to the nations. Time and time again in the Old Testament, people are told, the Israelites are told, basically to go tell people about God. And they're supposed to do it in such a way that brings unbelievers into the flock. They're supposed to do it in a way where, remember, they are a holy nation. That means that they're supposed to be distinct. They're supposed to have character, God's character, living inside of them. And they were supposed to look different than the ways of the world. And they were supposed to live in a way that people would be like, man, there's something different about them. The way that I'm living does not bring me joy or happiness. I want to know what secret they have. And doesn't that sound like what Christians are supposed to do? Like, aren't Christians supposed to live in a way that the world is like, I want what they got. You know, I want that peace that they walk around with. I want, I want that joy that they can't, that I can just see just coming out of their pores, you know, because this world is evil and this world is dark and it drains people and it brings them down and Christians are supposed to be that light. Now we know that Christian, if I could put it like this, Christianity is an extension or a continuation of, the, of Judaism in the sense that the earliest believers in Christ were Jews. And to be a Christian at its very basic definition means to be a follower of Christ. Okay? They were first called Christians in a city called Antioch as they begin to bring in um, Jews and, and Gentiles and to form the, the basis of believing during the first century. But God gave us the same commission. And what we know as the Great Commission to go and make disciples. Because the world is a much better place when people give their lives to God. Whenever they surrender and submit and confess their sin and allow their heart to be remade into the image of Christ, to become a new creation in Christ, our world becomes a better place. But in this instance, we see that Jonah didn't want God's grace to be given. So are there unbelievers like that today? Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, there are stories like that of believers who would rather the unjust and the wicked just get what they deserve. And yet, that competes against the grace of God. Now, God is just. And God is capable in all circumstances to bring justice, but it's the justice that He deems fit. You see, this entire city and this entire nation had gotten lost. They had gotten lost pursuing things their own way, being violent, um, being evil, but God still loved them. Could it be said of you today that there's someone in your life or someone that you know of that you just wish that God would stick it to? You know, that he would just drive it in deep. And I would also ask, from the lesson that we learned in the book of Jonah, is like, do you believe that really represents the character of God? Do you really believe that that's how God would have you to be? Is that the heart of God? When God gives grace, we should rejoice. And when we see mercy, we should be happy. And that's for believers and unbelievers alike. But are you guilty in some shape or form of being like Jonah and that you just wish that God would not be compassionate to that person? I would challenge you today, I believe that God would challenge us all to not be like Jonah, but to be like Jesus who is even willing to die on a cross for his enemies and willing to love them, asking God to forgive them.
because they didn't know what they were doing. So as we continue today and, uh, with our song, Have Thine Own Way, Lord, Have Thine Own Way, um, maybe God needs to have His way, a good way in someone else's life, and maybe it would be good for us all to rejoice.